Shalom and good evening from Galilee. I'm Amir Tsarfati, and this is our first ever Mideast update from Connect, our brand new hub in the Jezreel Valley here in the Galilee. I want to thank all of you for praying for this project, for contributing also financially. We're finally here. This is our first broadcast for our news. We may encounter some technical issues along the way. This is a trial and a test uh, uh, broadcast, but we sure want to start using this amazing place that God has given us here in this place, even throughout this war. Let's pray and then dive right into our Mideast update. Father, I thank you so much for your goodness. Thank you for this place that you have gifted us with. And now we ask that you will use it for your glory to bring truth to people, truth that will also be accompanied with the hope of our salvation and the only way, truth and life, which is our Messiah. And in his name we pray. Amen. So again, shalom everyone. This is Amir Tsarfati and this is our live Midis update from Connect from Galilee. And the whole point of this update is not to compete with CNN or Fox News. We simply want to connect the dots for you. There's so many things that are happening. There's so many people that are working behind the scenes on so many things around the world. And what we want is not only to bring sense to what is going on, but also hope and clarity. I believe that it's important in these last days to connect not only people with the news, but also the news with the Bible, the people with the land of Israel, the people of Israel with the Messiah of Israel, and the world with the Word of God. And therefore, the Mideast update is going to be a great way to connect people from all over the world with the truth of what is really going on here, all of it from a biblical standpoint. So let's start by dealing with our first topic. As you can see along our Mideast update, there will be a list on this side, <laughs> a list of all the topics that we're going to talk about throughout the update. And the first thing we want to do, of course, is the infamous Gaza war, a war that began on October 7th with a horrific massacre that took the lives of over 1,400 Israelis. And since then, more than 650 soldiers died in the war in Gaza. So the first thing I want to show you is where Gaza is, what is it all about, and what are we doing there right now? So that's the Gaza Strip in the southwestern corner of the map of Israel. You can clearly see that it is divided to five zones. The northern part, then the city of Gaza and its surroundings. Down below there is the Der el Balach, which is the central refugee camps. Khan Yunis, and last but not least, down on the south, bordering with Egypt, it is Rafah. Gaza itself is about 25 miles long. In its widest part, it is about uh, four and a half uh, miles, no, excuse me, seven and a half miles wide. And in its um, narrowest point is 3.7 miles wide. We're talking about an area of 141 square miles with nearly 2 million civilians that live there. I'm not sure I can call them civilians anymore because there are tens of thousands of terrorists that are wearing civilian clothes and there are hundreds of thousands of civilians that are assisting them, hiding them and facilitating so many of the terror events uh, for them. So this is the Gaza Strip and that is what is going on. Ever since October 7th, Israel decided to basically eliminate Hamas capabilities, we entered in, we maneuvered into 65% of the Gaza Strip, destroyed much of the infrastructure of terrorism, and killed tens of thousands of terrorists. 
And uh, then we pulled out, basically. We pulled out for a couple of reasons. There is no point for us to stay there when we can actually raid on terror hubs from specific locations. So basically, this is where we are right now. Take a look at this uh, particular location where we are right now. Uh, as you can see, we pulled out and in the upper part there is a corridor that crosses the strip from east to west and that is the Netzarim corridor. We're holding that piece of land for two reasons. And look, we cleared that area over the last six months to avoid any terrorists approaching the Israeli military uh, camps along the Netzarim corridor. This is where we're stationed, and from there we raid on terror bases up north in the Gaza city and down south in the central camps. Now, not long ago, about 40 days ago, we moved the Rafah population all the way up north, and we maneuvered into Rafah, as you can see, the last stronghold of Hamas battalions. We took over 40% of the city, as you can clearly see. And this is where we decided later on to move on. We created a one kilometer deep security parameter around the Gaza Strip and around the corridors that we are taking in order to prevent terrorists from approaching neither uh, the um, Israeli settlements or uh, or nor the uh, is Israeli forces which are inside Gaza. Now, we also need to be, uh, clarify that while we are in Gaza, in the corridor up north or in the, in the Rafah area, we took over the entire border line between Egypt and Gaza. That's the Philadelphia corridor. And right now, ladies and gentlemen, we are operating to unveil and, 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 and find dozens of gigantic tunnels that were used. And from the Philadelphia corridor, as you can see, we are raiding into the Rafah neighborhoods and refugee camps and the strongholds of Hamas. Take a look at, this is one of at least 25 long, wide and deep terror tunnels that were used to smuggle weapons, ammunition, and also products in and out, not to mention people also. And so this is where we are right now. Now, from this area, we were able to operate and deliver some amazing things. There are some active zones, as you can see, where in Gaza, in the central camps, and up north in Gaza City, we're still fighting. But these fights, we're dealing with them from the territory that we're already holding within Gaza. That's how we managed to raid all the way into the Nusserat camp to, uh, a week and a half ago and to rescue in a heroic mission the um, four hostages uh, over there. The Yamam, the Israeli special unit, the central unit of the police, is breaking into the apartment where Noah was held and the other three. Take a look. This is when the three male hostages, this is where we found them. Here they are, two of them on one side, another one on the other side. They did not have a clue that this is Israeli soldiers. And look at the fist bump that uh, we gave to that. And this is where we actually rescued Noah herself and took her all the way outside of her place. That's her. Take a look. Noah, it's okay. We're taking you. That's her with the pink shirt. They held her and took her all the way outside and rescued her. Ladies and gentlemen, in the most dense popula densely populated area in the heart of the largest terror base on planet Earth, Israeli troops and uh, special units were able to rescue four hostages alive, and that was a big blow to Hamas. 
Now, let me make it very clear. That was, that was obviously um, something that was, uh, I guess, possible because we were already there. We were there. We raided from where we were, and we managed to get our forces to airlift them from the territory that we already took from uh, the Gazans. Ladies and gentlemen, if there is one thing that Hamas cannot stand, and for them, that's the loss, that's the defeat, that's the humiliation, it's not the loss of life. They don't care if 10, 20, 40, 50,000 people died. They already declared that these are necessary uh, victims. What they do care is if land is being taken from them. And you can tell that by the conditions that they set for a hostage deal. They want immediately a full Israeli withdrawal from the Netzarim corridor, from the Philadelphia corridor, and to even clear the security parameter that we have all around. Well, let me say a few words about Hamas that maybe you don't understand. Hamas was established in 1987 long before Benjamin Netanyahu became the Prime Minister of Israel in 1996. Hamas is the acronym of Harikat Mukawame al Islami, which means it's the Islamic Resistance Front or Resistance Movement. It's not about Arab uh, identity. It's about Islamic identity. This is a daughter uh, organization or, uh, of, of the Islamic Brotherhood, which started in the 1920s in Egypt. So we're talking about one more terrorist organization that was born while Al-Qaeda was born in Afghanistan, and later on ISIS was born in Iraq and Syria. As far as Hamas is concerned, their aim, their goal, is the annihilation of the state of Israel. They haven't changed their charter that calls for the annihilation of Israel, leaving them intact, leaving them still ruling in Gaza, not taking from them their military capabilities and uh, being the regime in Gaza, will invite another October 7th, which, by the way, they already vowed to commit if they only have the possibility. It's important that we understand that we're dealing with a vicious, murderous terror organization and we have to uproot it. Now, it's very interesting because another organization that wants to destroy Israel, it's the organization that began shooting at Israel a day after October 7th. Let's now move to the northern border of Israel, the border with Lebanon. Take a look at the map and what is going on there ever since October 8. So as you can clearly see, we move up north. There's a lot of Israeli settlements along the border. On October 8, Hezbollah began shelling, firing rockets, anti-tank missiles, drones, and uh, mortar shells, and even terrorists tried to infiltrate through the security fence. In retaliation, Israel sent F-16s, helicopters, suicide drones, and other um, means that I'm not at liberty to talk about. And we also attacked their villages and also um, terrorist encampments, sometimes all the way up deep in the Baqa Valley, up on the right, if you can see, not to mention suburbs in Beirut where we uh, eliminated people in, uh, in the Dachya and around the cities of Tyre and Nakua. So take a look also at the, if we go back to the map, there is the Litani River. According to the, to the 1701 resolution from 2006 that ended the Lebanon war, the Hezbollah is not allowed to operate south of the Litani River. And guess what? Most of the war right now is against Hezbollah, which is south of the Litani River. So again, one more terrorist organization. And just today, Hezbollah said that they will not stop any of their attacks on northern Israel as long as Israel is still fighting in Gaza. They want us to accept 
a deal where Hamas stays in power, Hamas is not being disarmed, and Israel is pulling completely out of the Gaza Strip. Since that's not going to happen, obviously, there's only one other way to convince the Lebanese that they need to stop. Now, let me also make it very clear. In Lebanon, it's a very delicate situation. This is not a place such as Gaza where the population is totally behind the terror organization that is ruling. Hezbollah is not ruling Lebanon. Hezbollah is a political power in Lebanon, but Hezbollah functions as a country within a country and an army that uh, is within an army. The Lebanese army is not fighting against us, but it's the Hezbollah brigades and battalions that are fighting against us. And one of the people that we eliminated uh, about a week and a half ago was Sami Taleb Abdallah, who was the commander of Hezbollah's NASA unit, which is a big brigade that is located and supposed to operate on the border with Israel. So that was a big blow for them. We killed earlier throughout the war some other key figures in Hezbollah, and in response, they fired hundreds of rockets towards northern Israel. Um, very hot weather over the last 10 days did not only bring the fire from the rockets, but also forest fires that developed all around northern Israel. As you can see, there were efforts to put it out. But we also can say that the Lebanese suffered from the exact same thing. There were major fires on the Lebanese side, such as the one that you can see near the village of Shab'a, north of the Israeli border. Now, all of this is happening while Israel is dealing with several major obstacles and challenges in the war with Hezbollah. Again, we did not start that war. As far as we're concerned, Hamas invaded. We are hitting Hamas. It's Hezbollah that decided to, res to, to respond to the Israeli attack on Hamas. And now the entire Lebanese country is paying the price for it. By the way, it's not the first time Lebanon is paying the price for what the Palestinians are doing. It happened in the late 70s, throughout the 80s, and now it happens again. No wonder why within Lebanon there are forces among the Christians, among the Druze, and even among the Sunni Muslims that wants to rise up against Hezbollah to somehow recruit 20,000 warriors and not fight against Israel, but fight against Hezbollah itself. Kamil Shamoun, a politician, and other uh, people very high in the ranking of the political echelon in, in Lebanon have expressed their opinion that Hezbollah should not dare starting a war with Israel, a full-blown war. Right now, it's a exchange of punches in a way. It costs them dearly, it costs us dearly, but it's not a full-scale war. And again, one of the biggest challenges that we have right now is the challenge of their drones. Small, very, very, uh, I would say, slow, and if I may say, with low heat signature, which makes it very hard for our radars to detect. Take a look at one of those drones that uh, uh, we filmed not far from here. So that's a helicopter trying to hunt that drone. It's almost impossible. It's a small little drone, and the cameraman is trying to look for it because he hears the drone but he cannot see it and that's when the drone was captured as you can clearly see small little object flying right there and later on exploded the problem is that it's a short distance into israel low signature of heat for the radar and as a result look what we see when we make it and we destroy it, they are shattered to pieces. And by the way, unfortunately, it's also true to 
how they shoot down our super expensive UAVs. The Hermes 900 and the Hermes 450 um, just a few days ago. That was the fourth Hermes 900 that Hezbollah managed to shoot down, which tells us that they have the anti-aircraft capability and that is also something we have to take in consideration if a war breaks out and most of the initial attack is going to be of our Air Force. That's the Israeli drone that was shut down and fell all the way down, down there in southern Lebanon. So it's important that we not only see that, we also see that very sophisticated, guided anti-tank uh, missiles are hitting our surveillance systems and our air defense and air control units. This is one of the major bases on Mount Meron and look at the hit by a sophisticated precision guided anti-tank missile. It goes all the way to the dome that is covering the um, air traffic control unit and boom, hits it and creates a huge hole in it. So that's one more reason why Israel has to think 10 times before we go into war. Hezbollah has hundreds of thousands of rockets stored throughout the country. And unless Israel is striking preemptively full force, with hundreds of F-16s and F-35s destroying any possible cache of rockets and missiles that we know of, we better not even start. We need to either preemptively strike or not strike at all because a war with Hezbollah will be very different. Not only that Hezbollah is getting ready for a war, we know that uh, there is about 1,500 special unit Radwan forces that already began to wear the red headband, which signifies a war, and they're strapped with suicide belts and vests, and all they want is to go kill as many, and in the name of Islam, explode themselves and die as martyrs. 1,500 of the Radwan force, the elite forces of Hezbollah, are ready right there. And that brings me to the reason why the Biden administration invited or sent Amos Hochstein, special envoy, who met with Be Benjamin Netanyahu today in an effort to somehow find a political diplomatic solution to avoid a major war against Hezbollah. Make no mistake, northern Israel is, is not the same as it used to be eight months ago. Lots of areas are completely burned. Take a look at the, the map of the fire affected areas in, on the Lebanese side, but also on the Israeli side. There, we, we prepared a map for you so you can see. Again, that is the border with Lebanon. Here on the Lebanese side, as a result of the Israeli mortar shells and fire, look how many areas were affected. But unfortunately, four times that area was actually burned on the Israeli side. And we also marked the Israeli side of areas that were affected by fire. Take a look at that one right now. Take a look. Huge chunks marked with red right north of the Sea of Galilee, all the way towards Mount Hermon and the Golan Heights. Terrible, terrible things. Uh, hundreds of Israeli homes are destroyed along the border, and almost 100,000 Israelis left their homes, and they're like refugees in the rest of the country. So I don't think any of them is going to go back home unless Hezbollah is going to get hit, hit hard, and uh, then they know that going back home and rebuilding everything makes sense because they are not going to wait for another round of violence a year from now. So this is basically 
what we have also in the north. Apart from that fact, we have attacks almost on daily basis coming from Iraq, from Syria, from Yemen. And um, as you know, we already had our share in the month of April with Iran. So multi-front war with also Palestinians that are trying to harm Israelis from Judea and Samaria as well. So seven different fronts that we're conducting war with right now. Not easy, but God is in full control. Now, the most important source of information you can get for news from Israel is my Telegram channel. The Telegram channel is probably the only way where I can post videos, footage, and information that other social media platforms will not allow me. Unfortunately, though, um, some mean people and maybe even some organizations are trying to sabotage it. And t take a look at what they're doing. First, they are paying for ads on my Telegram channel so you will view another channel thinking it's me, but it's actually not me. And through that, they will contact you and eventually it'll be for financial gain. The best way for you to know that you're in the right channel is to look at the number of subscribers underneath my name. If you are following a channel that is less than 540,000, then you're not following my channel. Please unsubscribe and block and go and find the Amir Tsarfati with over 540,000. Now it's 541 already. And that's my channel. Any ad on my channel is not for me. It's a random ad someone paid for to Telegram. That's how Telegram makes money. I have no responsibility over it. I don't have a clue what you see. And I guess Telegram wants you to pay for a premium uh, account to avoid ads. But if you don't, if you want to use the free version, know that there are ads and they're not for me. So just ignore and avoid them, please. Now, after having said that, let me now talk about an important topic. And that is the petrodollar. Is that the end of it? Let me remind you that on June 8, 1974, the Saudi Arabian government signed a deal with the U.S. administration. A deal that would be for 50 years exactly. A deal that will allow the Saudis to receive from the United States weapons, defense systems, and some deals for oil sales. In return, the U.S would get exclusive right of uh, using their currency. In other words, Saudi Arabia could not make any deal for selling their crude oil unless it was done in U.S. dollar. That is something that kept the U.S. dollar uh, strong, and that's what we call the petrodollar. Energy deals that are only done in U.S. dollars. But guess what? On June 9th, 2024, the 50-year deal with, between the Saudis and the Americans expired. And guess what? Mohammed bin Salman, the crown prince of Saudi Arabia, did not renew that deal with the United States. America is pushing hard. America is trying to push for a comprehensive defense deal that will somehow, within the classified clauses, will cause the Saudis to continue with the use of petrodollar. At this point, the Saudis are free to use the yuan of China, the, uh, the rupee of India, or bitcoin or gold. In fact, India, which is the third largest importer of oil in the world, is already buying from the United Arab Emirates all of its oil in rupee, not in U.S. dollar. Yes, 80% of the energy deals still are in U.S. dollars, but the minute this 
deal is expired, no one is any more uh, you know, obligated to do it. If the US dollar is going to crash and the US economy is going to crash, the Democrats are going to lose the elections. And that is, ladies and gentlemen, where Israel gets into the picture. Saudi crown prince is not in love with the Democratic Party. If you remember, in 2018, the Saudi crown prince ordered the killing of Jamal Hachuki, the, uh, basically, I think it was a New York Times reporter, uh, Saudi reporter, that lived in America. He was in, uh, summoned to the Saudi consulate in, in uh, Istanbul, in, and where he was killed, his body was basically uh, cut to pieces, and his remains were smuggled out and were basically taken away. Nobody ever found him since. Um, ladies and gentlemen, the Democrats called the Saudi crown prince a cold blood murderer. Now, you know, if you know the Middle East, when you have an opponent and you are the leader of a country, just remember, Vladimir Putin did that. And may I also say, I know of some people that disappeared the moment they tried to talk against some presidents and former presidents of the United States. However, the Saudi crown prince is not in love with the um, democratic uh, administration. And I will also add to it that having seen how America treated the Afghans in the redra shameful withdrawal from Afghanistan, how America is treating the Israelis in the way they're tying their heads behind their uh, uh, back in the war with the Hamas, and how even uh, the Ukraine is being denied the right to use U.S. weapons to strike within Russia. All of that signals to the Saudis that they may not want to have a defense uh, deal with the Democratic uh, uh, Party ruled uh, uh, administration. They are waiting for President Trump, and if he's not going to win, they're going to hop on the Chinese wagon rather than do that. Now, how do they save face and avoid uh, signing a deal with this U.S. administration? They just raise up the price, raise up the stakes. And they're saying, for the first time, we want that the U.S. Congress will approve this deal. The U.S. Congress will not approve the deal unless Israel is part of it. So the Saudis are saying, we will include normalization with Israel only if Israel will recognize a Palestinian state, something that this current government is not going to do. So that is exactly why the Biden administration is doing whatever it can to topple this government, to harm Benjamin Netanyahu, and to cause destabilization in the streets of Israel so puppet government will rise, a Palestinian state will be recognized, and then they think, foolishly, that then the Saudis will be happy and a defense deal that will protect the petrodollar is going to save their skin from a massive financial collapse before the November elections. So if you thought that it's about the war in Gaza, it's about Hamas, it's about the massacre, it's not about that. Biden is not that much bothered by what's going on in Gaza, which, by the way, let me tell you, we already know that there is no genocide in Gaza. We already know that the UN updated its numbers when it comes to the death of children and women. We already know that there is no apartheid and terrorists are even treated in Israeli hospital. But the biggest lie was that there is starvation and hunger in Gaza. And a UN report that was released uh, on, I guess it was June 4th, is basically saying that there is no famine in Gaza. By the way, the UN never made it public. The media kept very silent about it. But, ladies and gentlemen, 
a United Nations report on northern Gaza failed to confirm earlier warning of famine. By the way, again, it did not stop the echoing and the parroting of it. Look at them. They're having fun on the beach. They're having ice creams all around. There are markets uh, that are selling goods. There is no hunger in Gaza. That's the market right now in parts of Gaza. And I want you to understand the lie and the deception about crazy death toll of uninvolved and about starvation and hunger. These are the things that moved the International Criminal Court and others to file lawsuits against Israel and to rule that our leaders are war criminals, when in reality, the UN knows it's not true, and the world is denied even access to the results of these um, uh, you know, investigations. They are very loud when they come against us with accusations. They're very silent when their um, committees eventually confirm that none of this is true at all. So it's very important that you know that we're pumping so much food into Gaza. Every day, hundreds of trucks. There is so much food. I think that there is more food in Gaza than in any other Palestinian refugee camp in the Middle East, where there is no war going on. So this lie and deception goes on every day, and nobody cares about it. By the way, the Muslim world is celebrating Eid al-Adha. But before I talk about Eid al-Adha, I want to remind you, if it's not about um, Gaza, and it's not about starvation, and if it's not about um, genocide, guess what? It's about the coming elections in America. Do not underestimate the coming elections in America. Strong demonic powers are active right now to try and bring that country down so the next phase of the globalist plan can begin. The wars in the Middle East and Ukraine and the failed immigration policies in America, Canada, Western Europe and Australia are all part of this picture. State-level cyber attacks and brainwashing tactics are being deployed by Russia, China, Iran, and North Korea. The gullible younger generation is under mental attacks like never before, while corrupt leaders are drugging their countries to do whatever it takes to avoid a conflict and pretending to have peace and safety. As an Israeli-born Jew, I have no solution, but as a born-again believer, I do. This is the essence of our faith in the Messiah. And as it's written in 2 Corinthians 4, 16 to 18, Therefore, we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, while we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. It's super important that we remember those things. Again, the Muslim world in the last few days is celebrating the uh, Eid al-Adha, the feast of sacrifice. This is the Muslim version of commemorating the sacrifice uh, of or the uh, attempt to sacrifice Abraham's son by Abraham. Remember, we, the Jewish people and of course anyone who believes in the Bible knows that it was um, Isaac that was supposed to be sacrificed and it, was, it took place on Mount Moriah which is the Temple Mount today. The Muslims, however, believe that it was Ishmael that was about to be sacrificed and that took place on Mount Arafat, not far from Mecca. That's the mountain. This is where they do pilgrimage. So once a year on the 
um, feast of sacrifice, Muslims from all over the world are flocking to Mecca for a hajj, a pilgrimage. They are surrounding the Kaaba, Kaaba excuse me, in Mecca, and they're also going to Mount Arafat. That's it, basically. They believe that it's Ishmael. We believe it's Isaac. They believe it was in Mecca. We know it was in Jerusalem. We have Jerusalem as the center of our faith. They have Mecca and Medina. The entire Jerusalem importance uh, to the Muslim world was only something that came hundreds of years later when the leaders of the Muslim world that were in Damascus were not in good terms with the leaders of Mecca. And the Mecca leader did not allow Muslims from Damascus to come for pilgrimage. Thus, there was a need for an alternative place to worship on the Eid al-Adha. And they came to Jerusalem because it made sense. Jerusalem was where the Jews believe Isaac was about to be sacrificed. So in a way, the faith of the Jews from the word of God, the God of Israel, caused Muslims to begin to hold Jerusalem as holy. It had nothing to do with the Quran, with the words of Muhammad. Jerusalem is not even mentioned one single time in the Muslim Quran. It has to do with inner conflicts between them, and it has to do with the option of going to Jerusalem because the Jews do that. So this is it. That's where we uh, are right now. And if we talked about the elections earlier, I also want to conclude with uh, something very important to tell all of you. Look, a lot of people are saying, I don't think I need to go and vote because whatever has to happen will happen. This is not the right way to live life as Christians. You can either take part in the globalist agenda or do your part to stand up against it. The fact that a person has a suicidal mindset doesn't mean we need to assist him in carrying it out. The same is true with our fallen world. We have a responsibility. We need to bring to the people the light of the gospel and the hope of salvation. We need to live lives that reflect our faith. We need to make smart choices based on our strong convictions regarding family, sexual identity, the sanctity of life, the unborn, and supporting Israel. If we say that as believers we can't or shouldn't be involved in politics, it's equal to running away from responsibility. This is especially true if that decision causes us not to vote. Remember, we're all watchmen. We can see things in the spiritual level as well as in the physical. The Lord said the following about the role of the watchman. When he sees the sword coming upon the land, if he blows the trumpet and warns the people, then whoever hears the sound of the trumpet and does not take warning, if the sword comes and takes him away, his blood shall be on his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet, but did not take warning. His blood shall be upon himself. But if, who, if he who takes warning will save his life, but if the watchman sees the sword coming and does not blow the trumpet and the people are not warned and the sword comes and takes any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity. That is blood I will require at the watchman's hand. That's Ezekiel 33, 3 to 6. In other words, we do have responsibility to make the right decisions to do the right things, even though the world is evil, even though eventually we know what's going to happen, we need to do our part for at least those who might hear and get saved for them to do so. So that's it for now. Um, I will get back to you with another Midis update in a few days 
with more mostly about what's going on in the north, the looming war. And until then, I want to bless you with the ironic blessing and remind you to follow me on Telegram. So let's, let's pray. Yevarechecha Adonai v'yishmerecha, Ya'er Adonai pana velecha v'yichuneka, Yisa Adonai pana velecha v'yasem lecha shalom. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and lift up his countenance towards you and give you peace. B'Shem Yeshua. Amen. All right, so guys, take a look at this way to subscribe to my Telegram channel. And until then, thank you and God bless. So again, thank you again, God bless you, and Shalom from Connect in Galilee.